Hello, I'm Chris Goodwin with the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. Welcome to this week's Streaming Only History is Lunch program, which is sponsored by the John and Lucy Shackelford Charitable Fund of the Community Foundation for Mississippi. We're working safely with the skeleton crew from our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium and the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. There are two events this weekend at the museums I want to tell you about. On Saturday, November 14th, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., the Mississippi Museum store will have its holiday open house with special sales, raffle prizes, artist and maker meet and greets, and tasty samplings from Chef Nick Wallace. Then on Sunday, November 15th, the archaeology collection staff will be cleaning artifacts excavated from here in Mississippi. You can see demonstrations of an atlatl, flint napping, deer hide shaving, and stick ball. Explore Mississippi's earliest stories in flash tours of archaeological exhibits in the Museum of Mississippi History. You can also take home an activity bag and create your own handmade pottery and beaded jewelry. That's free during museum hours of 12 noon to 4 p.m. And remember that the museums are free on Sundays. Finally, I hope you'll join us next week for our final streaming only History is Lunch, when we'll have Deanna Bird and Ryan Spring presenting the last Choctaw removal of 1903. Today is Veterans Day, and we're happy to welcome back our friends Kevin Green and Andrew Wiest to present Vietnam, War Abroad, Conflict at Home. Andy Wiest is the founding director of the Dale Center for the Study of War and Society at the University of Southern Mississippi and University Distinguished Professor of History. He has served as a visiting professor at both the United States Air Force Air War College and the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. His best-selling book, The Boys of 67, Charlie Company's War in Vietnam, was made into an Emmy-nominated documentary for National Geographic Channel titled Brothers in War. Wiest won the Society for Military History's Distinguished Book Award for his Vietnam's Forgotten Army, Heroism and Betrayal in the ARVN, and a New York Festival's International Gold Medal Award for the documentary Vietnam in HD. He holds a BA and an MA from the University of Southern Mississippi and a PhD from the University of Illinois, Chicago. Kevin Green is a fellow at the Dale Center and associate professor of history in the School of Humanities at the University of Southern Mississippi, where he is the director of the Center for Oral History and Cultural Heritage. Through the Dale Center, Green is principal investigator for the Mississippi Oral History Project, a research initiative funded by the Mississippi legislature to document Mississippi's culture and heritage in the 20th and 21st centuries. He's the author of The Invention and Reinvention of Big Bill Brunsey and has published in the Journal of Urban History, Journal of Southern History, Journal of Mississippi History, and the New York Times. We'll hear first from Andrew Wiest and then from Kevin Green. Andrew? Thank you. Thanks to uh, Chris for having us up today and of course the Department of Archives and History and thanks to everyone especially our veterans happy Veterans Day um, my goal today is uh, a daunting one to a certain degree um, what I propose to do is maybe give about a 30,000 uh, foot strategic overview of the Vietnam War the topic I researched the most but also then try to humanize that 30,000 foot view and kind of make the Vietnam War uh, come home in a, in a personal way. Of course, Vietnam is a huge topic, controversial topic. Uh, I've written a bunch of books on it myself, and there's hundreds of other ones, of course. I teach an entire 15-week class on it and really don't get all the way through it. Uh, that, and so in 15 weeks, it's hard to scratch the surface of this, and now we have to do it in mid-25 minutes, and then uh, Dr. Green following up with the home front look at things in the second 25 minutes. So what meaningfully can I cover in 25 minutes? Well, I guess we'll, I guess we'll find out. Uh, I'm a military historian, so uh, even, even in dealing with things in a broad brush way, uh, we're gonna be looking at troops on the ground and how, and how battles functioned or didn't function. Um, we'll start out by saying that um, one of the more popular things to look at in this war is how we limited it. I mean, we are the world's premier superpower at the time. Of course, Russia is pretending like they have a shot to take that from us, but they're not really. Uh, we're the world's premier superpower, and we're up against a third world power in Vietnam. How on earth could that go wrong? Uh, and, of course, that's the enduring mystery of Vietnam. Militarily, how do we not accomplish our goals in that war? And, of course, one of the big things to look at there 
is the limitations that we put on ourselves. And there's a lot about this we could talk about, but going to deal with it in only a pretty uh, surfacey kind of way. Just in looking at the theater of war map, uh, you can see um, uh, Vietnam doesn't look this way anymore. There's no more demilitarized zone in the middle of Vietnam. Uh, but we have South Vietnam to the south, North Vietnam, the bad guys to the north, and then Laos and Cambodia uh, to the west. Um, the most famous and debilitating limitation we're going to put ourselves in, uh, behind in this war is the fact that we make the decision mainly for fear of uh, this war spiraling out, spiraling out of control. We're going to make the decision that the military part of this war, bar some bombing, uh, will take place in South Vietnam. Uh, so we take off the table the invasion of the other guy's country, in this case, North Vietnam. We also take off the table the invasion of Laos and Cambodia. And if you're familiar with the way this war functions, that's how the enemy supplies himself. And so this wonderful thing called the Ho Chi Minh Trail that runs through those countries. So the way I like to put it in my class is, you know, if Vietnam is a football field, uh, we come to the conclusion at the very beginning of the war that's going to be illegal for us to cross the 50-yard line, where we're just not going to cross the 50-yard line into enemy territory. Um, you better have one really good field goal kicker to be able to pull off a war like that. Now, I do remember a game between Alabama and LSU for the national championship that kind of resembled this. It didn't go that well for the team that didn't cross the 50. Uh, but let's make things even worse, uh, since we know straight off from the beginning that the enemy is going to have an awful lot of troops based in Laos and Cambodia. Uh, not only are we not going into the 50, in this case, we're also not going to go into the uh, uh, friendly or opposing stands on the side of the football field. And, of course, the, the, the reverse of that is perhaps the most debilitating part of it. The enemy can cross the 50 at any time they wish. The enemy can and will live in the stands uh, to the west in Laos and Cambodia and can come into South Vietnam whenever they want to. The enemy is not abiding by the rules and limitations uh, we put on. So that is a debilitating uh, a set of restrictions, one that will effectively leave the initiative in this war entirely to the enemy. Uh, I give you a hint, if you ever fight a war that you plan, don't leave the initiative to the enemy for the entirety of the conflict. So that is a debilitating limitation. Um, Along that front, let's talk about the enemy. And here on this picture, on this slide, if you don't know who those gentlemen are, that is Ho Chi Minh to the left, uh, the political leader of North Vietnam for much of the conflict, and his military leader, Vo Nguyen Jap, off to the right. The same guy who had bested the French uh, in their conflict in Southeast Asia. Militarily, what are these guys going to come up with? Because I certainly think as a military story, and that's something you need to look at. What's the enemy going to throw at you? Well, they know straight up that America has a military capable of defeating the Soviet Union. They, have a, they know straight up that the American military can destroy the entire planet if we're willing to use all of, our, all of our strength and resources. So they know from the very beginning the one thing you don't want to do is take on the U.S. military toe-to-toe. -to -toe. That is a losing proposition. So they take that off the table. What they're going to do in the very best communist slash revolutionary way to fight a war is to actually avoid fighting our military because that would be playing by our game, our rules that would be playing to our strength. They're going to play to their strength and their hope is to prolong the war, use as their chief weapon time. It's the, uh, if you are into reading the way military history functions, this is called Maoist protracted war and it's, it's nothing new. Uh, we, we should have expected this. The French told us, hey, expect that, uh, as they were leaving in 1954. Um, chief weapon, time. Uh, their goal there is to not fight and defeat the American military, but their goal there is to fight and defeat what they view to be America's weakest point, our willpower. Uh, they believe themselves to be fighting for a big idea, independence. And they believe us to be fighting for a weaker idea, colonialism. Again, you can argue whether that's the motivating factor for Americans, but that's certainly how they saw it. So their idea is to fight a war that lasts as long as possible, not one that has great, huge battles with lots of blood flying around, i.e. Normandy or Kursk in World War II. They want a small drip of blood that lasts for years and years and years and years and slowly drains our willpower. Ho Chi Minh, when he had uh, been discussing the onset of the war with the French in 1946, had been in a meeting in France 
And he told him very prophetically exactly what he was going to do. He says, if we must fight, we will fight, and you will kill ten of us, we will kill one of you, and you will tire first, because they're fighting for the bigger idea they hoped. So protracted war, drag out the war so long that the U.S. will choose not to fight on any longer. And if you know your military history in depth, uh, you may hearken back to the guy who kind of invented the modern version of doing this, uh, that happened to be no less a person than George Washington, when he was facing the British, the world's leading superpower, as the head of a country that didn't even exist at the time, uh, America. Uh, his great weapon was to protract the war for eight years and hope the British tired of it, and it turned out he was very right. And so watch out the type of war you invent. You may have to face it one day. So we're limiting ourselves to the South Vietnamese geography. That's the only place we're going to fight except for some uh, curtailed bombing. And secondly, we're facing an enemy that has a pretty good idea how to upend this war and fight it in a different way. Well, now you are this guy. You are General William Westmoreland, commander of U.S. forces in Vietnam. You have the best army the world has ever seen. Pound for pound, the army we set and send into Vietnam is the best, strongest, most technologically sound army the world has ever seen to this point. He has 500,000 of the world's best ever soldiers. How to use that army is his big question. And of course, thing number one is taken off the table. Take that army, drive it to Hanoi and destroy their capital. Thing number two is taken off the table. Go into Laos and Cambodia and cut off their ability to fight. So the typical answers he would be given to this war are unable for him, uh, unavailable to him, which leads me to deal with him with a lot of sympathy. Uh, he kind of goes down in history as one of America's most misguided commanders. I don't think that's too far off base because I do think he comes up with the wrong answer. Even though he's been dealt a very bad hand, I think he's also going to play that hand poorly, which is a big, big part of what we're talking about today. His answer he comes up with, is attrition. Killing so many of the enemy it's that they choose not to go on. He and the military advisors above him often called this the crossover point. At some point you're going to kill so many North Vietnamese that the North Vietnamese decide they can't do this anymore. How can he do that? Because if the enemy is going to fight a guerrilla war, which means fight and run away, be elusive, the enemy's signal strength on the battlefield in a guerrilla war is elusiveness. So the enemy has all the initiative. The enemy is only fighting on territory that we're willing to fight on. Uh, the enemy, how do we make them fight in a situation where they, their whole rule book says don't fight? Well, Westmoreland thinks he has, and arguably he does in some ways, that he has a magical technological silver bullet. In this case, it's the helicopter. Uh, the way I like to put it to my class is a gorilla. What, do the, what does the enemy want to do? Hit us. You got to hit us. You got to make the American blood flow or this war won't work out the way you want it to. And then you run away. Well, um, gorillas run away from their chosen battlefield. I don't know if you're Usain Bolt, maybe you run about 20 miles an hour. Helicopters can chase you at 200 miles an hour. It short circuits the ability of the bad guys to get away. And so here's his idea, air mobility. Wherever the enemy shows himself, even though that enemy has the initiative, you can catch him and you can destroy him. Uh, the first big battle in which this happens is 1965, the Battle of the Yadrang Valley. And what happens here, well, that's a very busy map, so that map's not going to make a whole lot of sense unless you already know the geography. But what happens here is the enemy uh, jumps a uh, U.S. base, a U.S. South Vietnamese base, at Play Me, they cause us some damage and then they run away. If you see all the way to the left of this slide, they're running away to Cambodia where they'll be safe. Uh, we chase them with helicopters and we hit them at a place called the Chupong Massive, which you can see now at the bottom left of your map. And essentially we hit two entire regiments of North Vietnamese soldiers. Uh, with a couple battalions and only bits and pieces of battalions of American soldiers. We do lock them into battle. Uh, we do, over a three-day battle, uh, lose about 200 of our soldiers, killing about 2,000 of theirs, uh, which is a number that Westmoreland thinks works out very well because the attrition seems to have worked out great. Uh, 
course, the anime also gets a vote, and when they want to do this again, the anime in this battle figures out, hmm, here's how you fight against American helicopters. You don't do it. You, you, do, you just continue running across the border. What we see here is that Westmoreland thinks he's got the right answer. Also, if you want to back up, I'm going to see if I can actually back up slides. Looky there. Uh, those guys think they have the right answer, too. If both sides think they win a battle, somebody's wrong. And in this, in this point, I would argue it's Westmoreland who's wrong in this battle. What he decides to do after this is make this battle happen again as many times as he can. Uh, what they decide to do after this is make sure this battle never happens again, that they never cede their, um, the, the, their initiative. A couple other things that happened in this battle, uh, if you're familiar, there's a really great book on this battle called We Were Soldiers Once, uh, written by Hal Moore, the commander of the battle, and by the reporter who was standing next to him, Joe Galloway. So certainly one of the big, big aspects that most people talk about about the Vietnam War was that the media was everywhere. In the very first battle, there's a reporter right there, and the media is there then and then. It just keeps on going. So these battles will be reported on American nightly television every night. You're gonna, this is going to be the living room war. And since American troops are only at the Yadrang Valley to fight the bad guys, as soon as the bad guys are gone, the American troops leave too. And thus, this is not going to be a war about holding territory. This is a war about killing people. And so the most commonly associated term that comes out of the Battle of the Yadrang Valley is body count. We kill 2,000 of them. We lose 200. Thus, we, we, we must have won. And so Westmoreland's... Um, plan comes up with the end product of body count. That is the arbiter of victory in Vietnam. Unlike World War II, where you could stick blue pins on the beach at Omaha Beach, and once those blue pins touched Berlin, the war was over, you could judge that for yourself. In Vietnam, all you hear is every night, and this is one of the aspects of the war I remember, is that you watch the news every night, and they say every night, and today in Vietnam, ex-Americans were killed. Today in Vietnam, ex-Vietnamese were killed. And there's no end to the war in sight. This gets draining. This gets, it, it puts America behind the intellectual eight ball in this war. I'm already running out of time, so we're going to go, go, kind of run over some stuff quickly. What Westmoreland does is he continues this search to continue to find the Battle of the Yadrang Valley. And of course, this is, if you know any other term with Vietnam, it's probably this one. It's the term search and destroy. We're going to search for them and try to destroy them. Well, we try that again and again and again. And I'll just give you some numbers from 1967. In 1967 alone, we ran one million search and destroy operations from divisional size operations way down to small three-man team operations. One million. The number of those operations that actually made meaningful contact with the enemy were 1%. Because the enemy knew we were coming. Their intelligence is much better than ours. We're fighting in their backyard, not the other way around. And to put it bluntly, if you ask any American veteran who's been there, when you did run into them in big numbers, that's probably because they wanted to run into you. You rarely caught the enemy with his pants down. So what we get is a draining game of cat and mouse that's going to last for eight years, and it's going to unfold pretty much the way that Ho Chi Minh and Vo Nguyen Jap wanted it to do. Uh, to try to make this personal in the last couple minutes that I have left, I want to take this down to another level. Another huge uh, limiting factor is the fact that we're going to send a drafted army to Vietnam. Um, America decides not to send the entirety of its professional military to Vietnam. It can't because our main enemy, don't forget, is the Soviet Union, not Vietnam. And they could come thundering into Western Europe at any time. So we're going to send draftees to Vietnam in greater numbers than ever before, which is going to be Dr. Green's uh, what Dr. Green is going to focus on, what this draft does. What I want to do is talk about what this war does to specific draftees. Um, I researched one specific combat unit because um, I wanted to see, and this combat unit was 100% draftee. They were drafted in 66 and fought in 1967. So the self-serving part of it is you can go out and buy one of these books and spend your Christmas money uh, helping my kids make sure they have peanut butter to eat. Um, but there you go, run off and get one of these books if you wish. 
um, the, the long and short of it is, of the 160 men who went to Vietnam in this unit that I study, uh, 26 were killed and 105 were wounded in their year of combat. This is a diff- what Westmoreland does in 67 um, comes into these people's lives and has never left these people's lives. And here's just a couple of examples uh, from that. In fact, I'm just going to limit myself uh, to two because I'm already kind of running out of time. Uh, we'll skip the first one. Oh, don't pay. Well, this is the first platoon uh, in, in Charlie Company. These are the guys I'm talking about. Uh, you can't quite see all the faces in the back, uh, but of these guys, uh, seven don't survive the war. This is the last picture they take together uh, with them still all in it. Um, the biggest battle my unit fights is on the 19th of June, 1967, a day-long battle in which Charlie Company, one company, fights two dug-in enemy battalions. They're horribly outnumbered that day. They lose 10 men killed, and uh, 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 10 men killed, um, over 40 wounded, and they kill over 100 enemy that day. It was a tough one. Um, and the little, one little story I want to tell you about here is about the guy on the right. That's, that's Bill Geyer posing with his mom. That's his last picture he took with his mom the, on the day before he shipped out Bernice Geyer. Uh, he was the medic of 2nd Platoon, the platoon that gets really caught in a crossfire that day. One of his best buddies in the entire world is, um, and of course I'm on my, on my wrong sheet here, that's the way it tends to work. I've got to make sure I get my names right. There we go. One of his best buddies in the world is Elijah Taylor, the guy here on the left. He's the, uh, he the medic of 3rd Platoon. So they train together because they go to sp- specific medical training together. Um, 19th of June was Bill Geyer's uh, real trial by fire to see whether or not how he would react under combat. And he reacted wonderfully well. When the firing breaks out and his men are pinned down, he saves one man's life, and then he's off working on another man doing exactly what he's supposed to do, which is putting himself between his patient and the incoming fire, and 250 caliber gun bullets, uh, machine gun bullets rip through his chest, and, and he's killed. And uh, Elijah Taylor is across the battlefield, and this is my oral history with Elijah uh, talking about that experience. That morning, all hell broke loose. We got fire from everywhere out of tree lines and swamps. Men started returning fire, and our lieutenant began to call in artillery. Jace Johnson, the radio telephone operator, yelled, second platoon's hit, and the medic's down. And I knew that meant Bill Geyer. My best friend, Bill Geyer, had been hit. And I heard that he was up there near a shack that I saw. So I asked Jace, that's about 200 meters away, yeah? And he said, yeah, that's where they are. And so I started taking off my stuff. And he said, man, what are you doing? I said, I got to go help 2nd Platoon. I got to go save Bill Geyer. You got to go across that open rice paddy. And I said, yeah, I know. By that time, Lieutenant Hoskins had gotten the information that I was going across. And he came over and said, Doc, I can't order you to go across that rice paddy. It's too dangerous. I said, yeah, Lieutenant, but 2nd Platoon's down. Geyer's down. I got to make it across there. I got to save my friend. And he said, okay. Those buggers waited until I was out in the middle of nowhere, and they just opened up on me like nobody's business, but never did I think about going back. I just had to make it to that shack. So what I would do is run for about 10 or 11 meters and get down. Finally, I got there, and there were wounded guys all around. Some had no hope, so I just prioritized. Some of the guys were already dead. Then I found Geyer. He'd been hit twice in the chest with entrance and exit wounds. I was leaning over him, talking to him. Medics aren't trained to really tell a guy the situation he's in. So I was telling him, Geyer, we're going to get Chopper in and get you to the hospital. Just stay loose, man. Just stay loose. As I leaned in, I could see that he was fading. And I thought, oh, man. He had that stare on his face, that thousand-yard stare, and it couldn't move. But he looked like he understand, understood what I was saying, but he couldn't respond to it. Finally, he just drifted off while I was holding him. Gar was such a nice person. He had a baby face. He was real quiet. He was just a nice, likable fellow, a nice kid who got caught up in the draft, and he got killed doing his job, and that's all I can say right now. Um, another uh, person I interviewed was Bill Geyer's brother, who was five years younger than him, who had idolized Bill, and this is just a little quote from him. That day in July 1967, I answered the door, and there were two military people standing there. It was devastating. 
There were two well-dressed officers on the front porch in our, in our, at our home in Maywood, Illinois. I got mom and then ran upstairs crying, bawling once I'd established what was taking place. My mom had to call my dad back from work. The news set him back for years. I don't know if he ever really shook it. He and Bill had been so close. He was depressed for a number of years. He didn't get to the point where he couldn't function. He still carried out his obligations to the family, but he just lost all his vigor there for a number of years. My mom had raised us very religiously Catholic. We all had a good foundational base of faith, and I think that's what carried us through. The last story I'll tell before I turn it over to, uh, to uh, uh, Dr. Green is just another very personal story and uh, what the draft and war does to real people. And this is Jackie Peterson. This is Jackie's uh, graduation picture. She graduated in 1965. Uh, she was a cheerleader and had fallen in love with the captain of the football team, uh, uh, Don Peterson had a stormy uh, uh, high school uh, romance. They were the couple that always fought and then dumped each other, but always found a way to get back to each other. Uh, but it was that love everybody knew was gonna, was gonna make it. Um, they got married right after high school, and uh, Jackie uh, uh, got returned from the doctor with her positive pregnancy test the same day that Don received his draft notice. So he had his son, uh, quite literally a day before he shipped out. He got a chance to hold that baby one time before he shipped out to Vietnam. And uh, Jackie's last words to her husband were, uh, don't be a hero. Um, we need you to come back to us. Our family needs you. But if he knew anything about Don Peterson, Don Peterson was a hero. In May of 1967, his unit was cut off and surrounded, and his buddies were dying, and he jumped up to give them cover while they all got away, and he was hit in the chest. Uh, and killed. Um, sadly, uh, he was killed on Jackie Peterson's very first Mother's Day. She doesn't find it out until the next day that he's been killed, but she was now 19 years old with a six-month-old son and was now a war widow. Um, and the interviews with her were perhaps the most difficult interviews I had to conduct. And uh, she, she wrote me an email because one of the reasons they were difficult was that she'd always resisted finding out how her husband had died. And so she found out the details of his death through the, the writing of this book, which was uh, pretty tough to take. But once she had come to grips with the whole thing, she sent me the following email. Uh, These interviews have not been easy for me and have started up all the nightmares again. All the sadness has returned. This is 40 years later. I bring his pictures up and stare at him. Each new picture I find that somebody puts on the internet is a new treasure for me. I miss him. He was my best friend. We had great plans. He was the man of our little family, and he was doing such a great job. To this day, I resent having to play out this thing called life all by myself without him. It's just not fair. I found later that I'd transferred all those feelings I had for Don to the next person I met after his death. Somehow I felt I deserved being treated badly for letting my husband die. And to me, that's the most meaningful statement in the whole thing. She's a, an ocean away, but she felt she deserved being treated badly for letting my husband die. I realize now why I did the things I did made the choices I made. I realize now that the thrill of having a relationship like I had before is gone, of the complete contentedness I had at least for a short period in my life. In a little corner of my heart, I'm so sad that I'm all alone. When I talk openly about Don, I seem to sit in that corner where my only true, true feelings are. My husband's memory keeps me happy. So this, this strategic riddle that was Vietnam, uh, historians and pundits like to talk about it, but especially as we remember things on Veterans Day, those things that are taking place on battlefields far away are impacting real people and still continue to do this. The Vietnam veterans of this generation are still out there. Jackie's a Vietnam veteran. She never set foot there, but her life is defined by a war she never went to. So remember uh, those veterans, and I will now turn things over to Dr. Kevin Green. All right. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to jump right in, say happy Veterans Day to all, and thank you for your service. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wiest for uh, uh, your remarks and comments, and um, I'm just going to move right into the draft here. 
Uh, the Vietnam War brought uh, 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 the, excuse me, the Vietnam draft brought the war to the American home front, uh, and particularly the southern home front, unlike any other thing. Uh, during the era between 64 and 73, the U.S. military drafted about 2.2 million American men out of an eligible pool of 27 million. About only a quarter of those uh, of the military force would actually see combat and combat zones were, in fact, draftees. But American conscription caused a lot of different things, uh, especially for young American men uh, 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 reaching a, of that age, of the draft age. Some chose to, to volunteer so they could choose where they were going. Some folks left for Canada. Some folks sought deferments uh, um, with uh, wealthy parents. Some folks sought refuge in the National Guard uh, and, and the like. But the draft uh, signifies an important part uh, and it, what sort of looks, what my talk is about, um, represents an important part of how the South understood Vietnam and engaged with uh, uh, the war on the home front. So um, many soldiers did support the war, but to many others the draft seemed like a death sentence. So to solve this problem, uh, Lyndon Johnson, Secretary uh, uh, of Defense, Robert McNamara, had another idea. He wanted to dramatically widen the pool of draft-eligible Americans by essentially lowering the standards uh, uh, of, uh, for those who could enter into the armed forces. So in August of 66, McNamara went before the annual convention of the Veterans of Foreign Wars to kind of tell these folks that he's got a new plan. And he promised to salvage some 40,000 draft rejects and substandard volunteers, most of them from poverty-encrusted backgrounds and rural areas in the South, and the ensuing uh, 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 result was what became known as Project 100,000. And it became, in some ways, uh, a, a problematic uh, piece for the draft and, and, and for the future of the war. And it starts this kind of long history uh, in associating the draft and the problems at home with the draft uh, on the home front. Uh, McNamara noted that the military rejects 600,000 young men a year for failure to meet the minimum standards. And if we can tap into some of those folks, We'll have a good opportunity and we'll, have, we'll, we'll at least be able to increase some of the numbers. And there were plenty, uh, plenty of young people out there who weren't protected by student deferments but had flunked the military's entrance exam, the Armed Forces Qualification Test. If the standards for passing the test could be lowered, McNamara thought, tens of thousands of previously unqualified men would suddenly be available for military service. By 1969, 246,000 new standards men had enlisted in the Army, including 92% of who were accepted because of lowered mental standards. My own, my own father was a part of this program. He, would tell, he always told me I was too dumb to go to Vietnam. It's like I, I never understood that until I started to, to, to teach and research in that area. These folks would account for 10.7% of total recruits from October of 66 to September of 69. Anti-war activists viewed the draft as immoral and the only means for the government to continue the war with fresh soldiers. Ironically, as the draft continued to fuel the war effort, it also intensified the anti-war cause. The selective service deferment system meant that men of lower socioeconomic standing were most likely to be sent to the front lines. No one was completely safe from the draft, and almost every American was either eligible to go to war or knew someone who was. Of the 11 southern states, we're going to con uh, include Kentucky in there too, uh, provided about 30% of the soldiers who served in Vietnam, even though the South was home to 22% of the nation's population. As noted above, southerners also died and earned medals of honor in similar, uh, similar numbers. Approximately 27% of the military deaths uh, uh, and 28% of the Medal of Honor winners came from the American South. Southern blacks were far more likely than their white counterparts to be drafted and to serve in combat and to be wounded or killed. Between 65 and 1970, blacks con constituted just over 11% of the nation's draft eligible men. But during that period, the percentage of African Americans drafted ranged from 13.4 to 16 and the total of the total number of draftees. For example, African Americans comprised about 20, a quarter of the population in Shreveport, Louisiana, and 41% of the town's draftees. In 1965, black soldiers manned 20 percent of the combat slots in Vietnam, and in 1965 and 66, they suffered 25 percent of the battlefield deaths. Like the South's poor whites, Southern African Americans possessed few of the resources that enabled middle and upper class whites to avoid the draft. For example, only 5 percent of blacks nationally went to college during the Vietnam War, and percentages were even lower in the South. Race compounded the likelihood of blacks serving in Vietnam. In 1966, African Americans comprised a 
about 1.3% of draft boards nationally, and six southern states had no black board members at all, including Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, and South Carolina. In 1968, finally, three blacks were appointed to boards in Alabama, 15 in Georgia, and 35 in Arkansas, but two years later, South Carolina had only six black board members, and Mississippi had none. The selective uh, service system underwent a dramatic overhaul in 1969. Uh, Protests against the war and the ongoing protests against the draft, uh, uh, which affected a disproportionate number of poor whites and African Americans, President Richard Nixon sought again to find a new way to to, uh, uh, conduct the draft. Congress improved the decision to establish a lottery in November of 1969, and Nixon signed the measure into law. On December 1st, the Selective Service held its first draft lottery for all males born between 1944 and 1950. The lottery was carried live on radio and on television by CBS. Approximately 850,000 men were affected by the 1969 draft lottery. Wildly unpopular, the draft and the draft lottery drove how Americans in the South and on the American home front and led to how they understood the war, and led to significant transformations in how the U.S. and the South understood its place and role in this ongoing war. And uh, I wanna, th- here's a, a quick picture of a, a, a draft uh, card and the, the sort of la- uh, random lottery here. And you can see kind of how the numbers go, and they would go all the way from uh, to uh, 366 would be the total number. So here's this drama fo- uh, unfolding on radio and on television. Uh, as we move into this particular uh, period of the draft. I want to move away from the draft a little bit to talk more about uh, Southern politics during this particular period and uh, really drill down and look into one of our own in John C. Stennis and his role uh, in in, uh, the escalation and the the ongoing uh, um, Vietnam War and as as it grows from a a very mild situation in the mid-1950s to a full-blown war within uh, a decade or more. Elected to uh, the Senate in 1947, veteran Mississippi politician John C. Stennis, along with Richard Russell, Democrat of Georgia, and Harry Byrd, Democrat from Virginia, uh, they they sort of took him under their wing, and he quickly became a very powerful force in Congress. Of course, ardent uh, segregationist, uh, uh, Mississippi uh, Democrat, longstanding Democrat, he took the seat vacated by Theodore Bilbo, if that gives you any kind of indication of where he's coming from. Uh, he quickly gained a reputation as a, ver- a workaholic, a, a someone who worked long hours, uh, knew how to m- uh, maneuver in, in and out of Washington within the Senate, and in a short uh, uh, three or four year span, he became known as a senator senator, a, a really powerful force in the Senate and one that could be relied on. Following his appointment to the Armed Services Committee in 51, he took an increasingly active interest in national defense and foreign relations. His influence over national defense policy grew dramatically when, in 62, he became chairman of the Preparedness Investigating Subcommittee of the Senate Armed Services Committee. This powerful subcommittee exercised much of the Senate's oversight of the Defense Department and was empowered to investigate aspects of military affairs. Over a 10-year period from uh, 54 to 1964, a clear majority of the South's, and this is a a great historian I'm, I'm, I'm quoting here, a clear majority of the South's influential political figures in Washington had opposed committing U.S. military forces to direct combat in Southeast Asia. While so doing, they developed arguments in favor of restraint against American military involvement. They also addressed, but offered, less consistent opinions on the executive office's foreign policy as it related to Congress, an issue that would prompt sharp disagreement that would challenge both Johnson and Nixon's assumption on the president's war-making powers. John C. Stennis was a big part of this and how this starts to unfold in the Vietnam period. By August of 64, well-established Southern foreign policy ideas such as Uh, personal and national honor, anti-communism, partisan democratic uh, political calculations, and then, of course, uh, southern ties to other southern politicians led these representatives like Stennis to kind of get to discard their caution in favor of what would become a national commitment to support uh, South Vietnam and oppose the uh, the North Vietnam and the National Liberation Front. So Stennis, his, what will happen is his approach will evolve during this entire period, especially as he becomes more and more uh, powerful, shall we say, within the United States Senate. 
as it, uh, the, the situation began to uh, deteriorate even further by the mid-60s, Stennis concluded that if the U.S. were going to be effective, it would have to take over command. He arrived at this position, one he opposed in 54, but by the time we get to 1965, as he told uh, constituents in Meridian, Meridian, Mississippi in May, there was no quick and easy solution to the Vietnam problem, and U.S. involvement will become even greater before we reach the end of the trial. Stennis, like most Americans in 1965, couldn't possibly understand that this little country uh, in, in Southeast Asia, that we wouldn't be able to impose our will upon them. Meanwhile, things became more turbulent for the presidency of Johnson. He was in, uh, uh, engaged in his, uh, uh, and here's Stennis talking with Bob McNamara, um, and then here is Dennis with uh, President Johnson. As he became more and more engaged with his great society programs and civil rights legislation, um, many of these uh, Southern conservative senators took it as an opportunity to shift their focus away from support of Johnson uh, and his great society programs by favoring an all-out approach to the war. So as these society programs uh, became a big part of the Johnson platform, quote, Johnson feared that deserting the woman I really loved, the great society, for that bitch of a war, unquote, would result in losing everything at home. In late 64, he predicted correctly, that is Johnson, quote, those damn conservatives are going to sit in Congress and use this war as a way of opposing my legislation. People like Stennis don't want to help the poor and the Negroes. They'll take the war as their weapon and argue that beating the communists was the first priority. But if beating the war impeded domestic reform, losing it would surely doom these measures by provoking an endless national debate. And that's something that actually did take place. So one of, the, one of uh, uh, Stennis' favorite, or, or favorite lines or, or catchphrases here is that at some point, given these great society programs and civil rights legislation, the United States is going to have to choose between guns and butter. Ironically, many of Johnson's most dependable Southern backers at the beginning of the war, like Stennis, were also among the harsher, his harshest critics of the great society programs. As one historian has said, the South's established opposition to limited war and the rise in demand for more aggressive bombing in North Vietnam became the reasons for the South's negative evaluations of Johnson's performance as a commander-in-chief. The South's disapproval of domestic programs reinforced this uh, perspective uh, and uh, kind of galvanized their negative look at his Vietnam leadership. For, for Southerners, his biggest misstep was to push the pace of African-American integration way too fast. As a member of the SASC, or the Senate Armed Services Committee, Stennis had particularly close ties to the U.S. military and regularly represented the Pentagon's point of view on Vietnam. The senator voiced the dismay of Southerners by asking how the United States, with its great power, had failed to secure a decisive and relatively quick military victory against small and underdeveloped country like North Vietnam. His answer, the administration's decision, was to fight what amounts to a holding action. And the civilian imposed restrictions that prevented the military from waging a hard hitting and uh, all out attack in North Vietnam needed to change. It was time to take the gloves off. He, he uh, was even considering using all, if China were to get involved in, in uh, uh, the Vietnam War, that he was willing to use nuclear weapons against the Chinese and the Vietnamese if that's what it took to, to, to win the war. By the time we get into the end of the Johnson administration and the rise of the Nixon administration, uh, he had began to shift yet again. Many of these conservative senators found in Nixon a ardent uh, anti-communist, a, a, uh, a strong military leader who wanted to use military as a, the military as a way to, war, to wage uh, American foreign policy. But they, they also began to understand, with the growing anti-war movement, they, there was a dissenting voice that was starting to become louder and louder and louder. And so uh, John C. Stennis, by the time we get uh, into the Nixon administration, uh, even though all the stars were aligned for Stennis and these conservative senators to back Richard Nixon, being the political opportunists that they were, they started to listen to the anti-war and were uh, more scared of it, the anti-war demonstrations and culture that was out there, and more scared of it than they led on. And in doing so, by the time we reached 1971, behind closed doors and eventually uh, in open chambers, Stennis and some other conservative uh, southern legislatures 
uh, legislators would start to draft and craft what would become the War Powers Act. So here we come full circle. Uh, uh, Stennis says at one point hesitant to become in the war, uh, to, to get involved in the war, and then he becomes a huge proponent of unlimited bombing in North Vietnam and supporting an all-out uh, 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 assault and, and uh, the use of up to 600,000 troops by the end of the 1960s to the point at the turn of the 1970s that one way to limit and to control this war in Vietnam is to move power away from the executive office and back to Congress and that's what they intended to do. All politicians, I'm going to move here into the anti-war movements in southern colleges and universities and also within the civil rights movement, but this is directly tied to some of the voices and the echoes that these southern politicians were hearing. All politicians, whether they admitted it or not, were highly concerned with the growing youth movement's rejection of the war. Yet in the South, consistent with their parents' attitudes, white Southern students were significantly more pro-war than their peers. In fact, the only uh, uh, Vietnam-era demonstration on Southern Miss's campus was, in fact, a pro-war, uh, pro-Vietnam War demonstration. At first, anti-war protests on Southern campuses were less numerous and attracted fewer participants than those in other regions. But many Southern states had long histories of human rights protests and civil rights organizing dating back well before the Vietnam War began. Much of this centered on, open voting, uh, on uh, opening voting rights and uh, access to public accommodations. So there had been this tradition in the South uh, uh, already before uh, the Vietnam uh, uh, took off. By 1965, the Vietnam War had become part of this struggle in Mississippi. One year following Freedom Summer, Macomb, Mississippi's movement learned that one of their own classmates at Berglund High School was killed in combat in Vietnam. They wrote the, these uh, uh, folks working, these uh, SNCC workers working in uh, um, Macomb, Mississippi's freedom movement, uh, wrote and released a public broadside declaring in part that Negro, quote, that Negro boys should not honor the draft. Mothers should encourage their sons not to go. Why should they fight and die for a country unwilling to uphold civil rights for black Mississippians? Their public denouncement was the first anti-war statement from within the civil rights movement and paved the way for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee to take a stance against the war, which they did in 1966. Violence ensued following these declarations, but they did mark a significant move of the civil rights movement into the anti-war movement. On April 4th, 1967, of course, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his seminal Riverside Church speech condemning the Vietnam War, declaring, quote, my conscience leaves me no other choice. He described the war's effects on both America's poor and Vietnamese peasants and insisted that it was morally imperative for the United States to take radical steps to halt the war and through nonviolent means. King's anti-war sentiments emerged publicly for the first time in 65 when he had declared that millions of dollars can be spent every day to hold troops in South Vietnam and our country cannot protect the rights of Negroes in Selma. But he, uh, so for years, uh, behind closed doors, MLK was making, making uh, uh, comments and statements that, uh, about the Vietnam War, but in 67 he finally comes out with it. In this environment, the Southern Student Organizing Committee, 19, uh, which existed from 1964 to 1969, based out of Nashville, became the principal anti-war and civil rights organization for white students in the South. And uh, uh, joining the SSOC required great courage since these activities could lead to loss of friends, condemnation or rejection by one's family, and expulsion from school. From 64 to 69, these folks organized 50 chapters with 500 members who became critical to demonstrations at the University of Texas, the University of North Carolina, the University of Virginia, the University of South Carolina, Emory University, and dozens of others. Ultimately, the adoption of the anti-war students' message that the U.S. should leave the war simultaneously, loathing the messengers, suggests the impact their message had on the region and the country. Students have been correctly termed the foot soldiers of the anti-war movement. Far more college students, both nationally and in the southern U.S., actively protested the war than any other single group. The sheer number, uh, numbers were critical to demonstrations on and off campus, and these demonstrations kept the war in the public eye, challenged the morality and practicality of U.S. interventions and actions, and heightened the general perception, the national melees and crisis that had ended in the war, that made ending the war even more urgent. There were no established anti-war groups on Jackson State's campus at the height of the Vietnam uh, War era, 
although uh, tensions uh, uh, were still strong. Activists there nevertheless mobilized to protest both the com uh, Cambodian invasion and the Kent State shootings that had happened uh, in, in, in May. Some 200 to 300 students boycotted classes and still more participated in a protest rally and conversations about KSU, Cambodia, Vietnam, draft, etc. continued on the campus in the days to come. It was in the midst of this nationwide unrest that law enforcement opened fire on students at Jackson State uh, shortly after midnight, May 15th, 1970, uh, um, the all-white Mississippi Highway Patrol uh, uh, opened fire in and, and one of the most notorious and difficult chapters in this city's history and in Mississippi's history. Uh, I know Nancy Bristow was here not too long ago providing uh, a, a good talk on her uh, wonderful book, so I will stop that there. Um, so, in, indeed, the extent of student discontent in the conservative pro-war South during 1969 to 1970 could only have served to intensify these beliefs. The American public, uh, the Nixon administration, and politicians like John C. Stennis had come to ex uh, expect student protests in Berkeley, Madison, and New York City, but not pitched battles in Columbia, South Carolina, where 20, or 20,000 marchers in Austin, Texas, or a week-long strike in Charlottesville, Virginia. In many ways, uh, the South um, magnified some of the, the larger national issues associated with the Vietnam War and the Vietnam era, and it is often overlooked as a region that helped define politically uh, through the draft and also through student movements. It's an it's a era that, it's a region that's overlooked in how we understand that particular war. I've got about three more minutes, so I want to move on and uh, point out something here. Um, much of my talk today is uh, expounded upon in this great book by Joseph Fry, The American South and the Vietnam War. He raises a really fascinating point within this book, and one that I think for those of you historians who are listening out here, we have a massive gap in Vietnam War historiography, in civil rights uh, historiography, and also in uh, um, African American history and historiography, and I I'll tell you why. Um, this is Charles Brown, U.S. Army uh, 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 173rd Airborne Brigade. He served in 1967 and 1968 and fought in the Battle of Dak Tho in Vietnam, uh, where he was awarded two bronze stars and received the Purple Heart for his valor and bravery and for his uh, uh, service. Uh, Mr. Brown uh, is from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and he realized as a graduating senior from high school that he and uh, his family, who were, he came from a, a family of veterans, that his temperament did not suit the Jim Crow uh, uh, world that existed in Hattiesburg in the late 1950s and early 1960s. He knew that if he were to get involved in civil rights organization, he would either wind up in jail or killed or both. So his path was a first uh, 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 train ticket out of Hattiesburg and out of Mississippi and into the United States military. For far too long, I would argue as a historian, that we have uh, ignored the countless African Americans who joined during the civil rights period across the 20th century, but particularly the post-Brown period all the way through the Vietnam War era, who joined military service in so many ways exercising their own civil right to escape Jim Crow, to escape poverty, to escape the trappings of racism. And we know so little about these individuals. It's high time that we began some serious study to look at collectively organizing and investigating those who exercised a fundamental civil right in serving their own country to escape poverty and Jim Crow racism. So at this point, I'm going to stop, and we will take questions from uh, the audience. Thank you, gentlemen. That was great. We have a question here for Kevin from Deirdre Payne. She says, Kevin Green, of the 5% of blacks you say were in college, and that number seems low to her, what percentage of those were drafted to Vietnam? I knew personally five black college men, all on the dean's list, who were drafted. All of them were assigned to combat units and saw battle. All of them returned suffering from PTSD. 
one high school friend was drafted and killed there. So again, of 5% of blacks you say were in college, what percentage of those were drafted to Vietnam? I, I don't have the specific answer to that. Uh, uh, I would ha that's a pretty deep statistical question, but one that I'm sure is available and out there. I would say that she's right, and, and African Americans, and Andy can speak to this probably better than I can, uh, disproportionately served, uh, especially from the American South. And their experiences were um, very often combat related uh, and in some type of active duty overseas in, in Vietnam. Yeah, the only thing I could add to that was that from the sample of veterans that I've interviewed, um, first off, you're unlikely to go to Vietnam at all if you're a, if you're a full-time college student because you have the deferment. But of course, many African Americans are in a position at this point in time where they can't afford to go full-time. So if you're a part-time college student, you're still open to the draft. And so two of the two of the gentlemen I interviewed were indeed college students, but were drafted out of the college because they could only afford to go full time. Hmm. So I think that might be a causational factor to many African Americans who were in college actually being drafted at that time. Yeah. Uh, I had a question about the Berglund High School Macomb, uh, the SNCC statement in opposition, whether that came before um, Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali's public resistance to. Yeah, it, it's all kind of happening about the same time, right? Um, this, it's that moment where the draft becomes part of the central narrative of, of how young people mm -hmm. associate with the Vietnam era. Cassius Clay, of course, is an enormous part of that because he uh, um, becomes such a powerful voice in, in, in um, kind of combating this, not just this age of American foreign policy and how America sees itself, but uh, the idea of imperialism altogether and, and, and kind of this is where he begins to transition in, in, into uh, uh, black nationalism and, 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 and all that, that, that particular period. All this stuff is, and that's, you know, we teach history, and I guess we teach this all the time and to our students, we teach history in its deconstructed kind of linear model, but the truth of it is, is it's all these concentric circles, all this stuff is happening at the same time and they all kind of inform each other. Uh, someone like Muhammad Ali, of course, has m a much larger platform than these young students uh, f on, in the trenches in Macomb. This may be a question for Andy. Uh, what was the final body counts for the Vietnam War and what were Mississippi casualties? Wow. Um, I, I, sadly, I do not know the Mississippi numbers. That might have been smart of me to look that up before I came here. But uh, the U.S. N numbers uh, are generally... Of course, there's always the MIA POW issue, uh, the accounting for those uh, casualties. But the U.S. numbers, if you go to the wall in D.C., are slightly over 58,000. Uh, if you look at the other side, uh, numbers are much closer to and over a million. Um, so the, the fighting us in a protracted war was not an easy task for them. They, they, paid, a, they paid a very heavy price, and their government was very brutal in and making sure you were in the military if you were in North Vietnam. This may be for both of you. Uh, what did families and friends send to their soldiers in care packages, and what was it that the soldiers actually wanted to get? Were they getting what they had hoped for? Um, the, the soldiers I, I dealt with loved talking about their care packages. Lord have mercy, they loved talking about those. <laughs> And the, the two things that they consistently wanted, I mean, other than, you know, staples from home, like if you're from the South, a particular kind of barbecue or whatever, but the two things they all talked about was a, any kind of Kool-Aid or something like that to make the water taste better, because the water is specifically with iodine put in it to make it less, you know, uh, uh, capable of carrying diseases, the water tasted I was going to use a very bad word, but well, water tasted horrible. <laughs> and the second thing that they all loathed were any form of sea rations, especially uh, um, uh, beans and I forget what the beans went with, but they hated those. And so they wanted hot sauce or anything to make those sea rations huh. taste any, anywhere near better. That's the number one things they always asked for, Kool-Aid and hot sauce. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Uh, this was great. Thank you so much. I, I know we could have done with more time, but I appreciate y'all shoehorning it into what we had available. Um, don't forget about our events coming up. 
this weekend here at the museums on Saturday, the store open house, and then on Sunday, the archaeology uh, collection staff doing cleanings and demonstrations. Then tune in next Wednesday for Deanna Bird and Ryan Spring talking about the final Choctaw removal of 1903. Today, though, thank you so much, Kevin, Andy, for being with us on Veterans Day. Um, look forward to hearing more about what you all have going on at the University of Southern Mississippi and the Dale Center in 2021. Yes, sir. Thank you for thank having you us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Glad you liked it. Okay, cool. Uh, I was kind of scrambling through it. Um, there's so many great Stennis quotes. And all the you get these these 